Welcome everybody to uh, the first RIEEE webinar of 2022. Um, today, uh, Dr. Jamie Russell is going to be hosting us and emceeing. Um, Jamie is uh, the director of the Appalachian Energy Center and a professor in the Department of Sustainable Technology in the Built Environment. Um, and I will pass it to you, Jamie, and thanks everybody for joining. Thank you so much, Christine. Um, let me share a screen here. We'll just, we'll jump in with a presentation. Um, I can get to the right spot. Can everybody see that okay? Yes. yes. So I have, I have the great job of um, just introducing everybody and then being quiet, which um, I, I can, I think I can do. So uh, I did, I did want to introduce this topic a bit. Um, it's, it's a, um, you'll see, if you can see the screen down the bottom, uh, you'll see the list, the list of speakers in order. I'm just going to open up. Um, and in order of, in, in speaking order, we have Rodrigo Mercado Fernandez, who's a postdoctoral research scholar with the Appalachian Energy Center and Jennifer Schroeder Tyson, who's a lecturer with, at our College of Health and Exercise Science, and Maggie Sugg, who's an associate professor in geography and planning. Uh, so we have this great interdisciplinary group. And so I just wanted to quickly tell the story of, of how this group came together. And we've just come together. So what uh, we would like to do today is just tell you a little bit about the problem we're working on. Uh, and hopefully do about 10 minutes each on the presentation. So there'll be time at the end to discuss, uh, answer your questions, get your feedback. Um, but basically what we're trying to do in a nutshell is take two data sets, uh, the utility and power data and, and associated outages and medical data and merge those uh, in, in a sensible way to see the impact um, that energy has on health. I won't, I won't say any more because I'll ruin, I'll ruin the fun. But um, the story of the collaboration, this, this collaboration started a, a little while back. Um, and I see, um, I think I've lost, I've lost my screen, but um, Shelly Shelley is here from the Clean, the Clean Energy uh, Group. And we, we uh, Rodrigo and I, uh, after working with PV and storage systems that low to moderate income households and we installed four systems and we're monitoring the data right now. And our goal is to try and set some new rate structures that, that take into account the value of these systems. Uh, and as part of that process, we, uh, we spoke with um, Seth Mellendor, who's, who's now the, 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 new, uh, the new director of the Clean Energy Group. Uh, and we were looking at uh, Hurricane Maria, but as we, as we looked at these, as we looked at putting these uh, 30 to $40,000 systems at low to moderate income households, looking at payback with the standard routes, it became obvious that you know we were looking at this the system the system's lifetime it would take to pay back just from energy savings, and the real value of the battery storage of adding battery storage uh, really was around the resilience it could provide at households, uh, and looking at looking at our households they're mostly they're mostly rural. Um, and so there are things like well water. If you if you lose power and you don't live in a city, you lose you lose drinking water. And so we size the systems to to take care of the well pumps ahead of time. Uh, but uh, it also became clear that those streams, those value streams, and typical things that we we as engineers think of, like you know your refrigerator running and having communication, those are very valuable. But there are a lot of undiscovered and potentially um, potentially uh, valorizable, uh, I'll make up a new word, streams that could be associated with health impacts. And so that's when we, Rodrigo and I realized we were over our heads and we reached out for help. We, we screamed help and uh, luckily uh, Jennifer and Maggie uh, were willing to help us out. So I'll, I'll move on there and pass it on to Rodrigo. And, uh, and if, you, uh, if you can just give me a shout when you want me to advance the slides. Um, I'll stop there and uh, we'll, we'll have the speakers roll, roll forward with the presentation. All right. Well, thank you, Jamie, uh, for that introduction. Uh, and so as Jamie mentioned, while we were looking at the deployment of this uh, pilot project, uh, one of our main concerns was um, how can these systems be economically viable or, or justified 
uh, for low-income households based on the large upfront costs. And for this, we were looking at uh, both uh, direct and indirect value streams where the, the easiest to under, understand is the direct value stream by the system uh, where the soul, where it can help to reduce the energy burden of the household. So it can, uh, specifically the solar component of it can help reduce the energy consumption. Uh, so how much the, the household is consuming. Um, and depending on the local utility and rate structures, also we can have added value uh, given by the storage component. Uh, so if there's a uh, time of uh, time of use rates uh, throughout the day, this can allow the, the storage system to provide more value by charging during um, times when electricity is cheaper or using excess solar and then discharging in the evening. So uh, this, uh, this helps improve the value of the system, but depends on uh, the local rate structures. And uh, some indirect value streams uh, that the system can provide, not just to the household, but to the utility community and potentially to the local county uh, could be that uh, depending on how many systems you have in an area, they can provide uh, grid services. And, but specifically uh, what we wanted to dive into is what, what's the value of increased resiliency. And as Jamie mentioned, is spe specifically for uh, medically vulnerable populations. So people that have uh, medical devices that are electricity dependent. Uh, so what's the value to the household and what's the value to uh, say the local county or healthcare services? Uh, can we go to the next slide? And so to try to estimate the value of this resiliency. Well, and in, you know, in this case, I, basically I could just say, you know, <laughs> blame it on, blame it on the boss. <laughs> Um, so here we have uh, some hypothetical uh, data. This is the kind of data that, that we're trying to look at. So uh, here in the blue, we have, uh, we, we want to try to estimate what's the probability of having a power outage of a given duration, where the longer the power outage, the less likely it is to happen. And given that power outage duration, uh, what's the probability that this person will have to go uh, to a local healthcare facility where the, the longer the outage, the, the higher the probability that, this, that somebody in this household will have to go. And so with data on the number of households in an area that, have, that are uh, medically vulnerable to power outages, uh, the number of power outages, say in a year, and the outage duration, uh, of each of those incidents, uh, we hope to be able to estimate so what's the total health care cost, um, say to a local county or, or a healthcare facility uh, attributed to blackouts. Um, can we go to the, to the next slide? And so to, to be able to try to estimate this, uh, currently one of the things that we're trying to find is uh, more detailed outage data and so currently through the EIA, we can find uh, average annual data on uh, SAFI. So this is system average interrupt interruption frequency uh, in a given year. And so here we have for North Carolina from 2017 to 2019. And, it's, and right now it's broken down per uh, utility. So for each utility, uh, what was the average uh, frequency of power outages? Um, and we can also see, uh, can we go to the next slide? Uh, average duration uh, for outages. So this again is for um, uh, average outage duration for North Carolina from 2017 to 2019. And so while this is uh, interesting for us, uh, well, the data that we're uh, that we're looking for are all the numbers that were used to calculate these average frequency and duration outages. Um, that would allow us to better estimate um, the number of households uh, affected. Uh, can we go to the next slide? Uh, and they, uh, the EIA also provides some data um, through their electric power monthly reports. 
on, uh, on major disturbances and unusual occurrences within the US where they can give the outage duration and number of affected customers. But still the state is a, is a little bit uh, limited and um, oh, I, ideally maybe we would uh, get this data directly from, uh, from a utility that would be interested in working with us um, or something because yeah, we're, we're still having difficulty uh, tracking down the correct uh, outage data. Uh, but with that, I'll uh, pass it on to Jen to talk a little bit more about the, the medical side. Thanks, Rodrigo. Excellent overview. Uh, excited to be a part of this, but also we're still at that phase, like Jamie mentioned, of trying to figure it out, doing that that dance of what what are we doing? What, you know, how could we do it? So a lot of what we've talked about so far is around that context and. Um, just to follow up on what Rodrigo just talked about is, you know, there are local emergency planning committees where these folks are sitting at the table with emergency managers, public health officials, um, potentially could we make a request or could we come up with a tactic to get this kind of data um, that we've gone down that road. Um, we've gone down different roads around health impacts. So there's uh, quite a bit of information from Puerto Rico post Hurricane Maria around infant feeding and lactation, which was really fascinating um, what that impact is. And we know in public health that, you know, fed is best. And if women or lactating women can have access to what they need, and one of those is power, they're more likely to have longer duration rates um, and so on. We talked about, there's a little bit of research out there connecting COPD to the use of um, emergency rooms and how often, uh, specifically during power outages. And then uh, Rodrigo and Jamie, before we even met, were thinking about uh, various pharmaceuticals that might be refrigerated or kept in a, in a certain environment, specifically insulin with diabetes or, um, you know, the, the Nuva Ring with birth control. So you can kind of see what sort of conversations and ideas we not only found um, that was already published and looked at, but also, you know, some of the emergency situations where power had gone out, what was some of the impacts um, and then we started to talk a lot about what data is out there from the health perspective. And um, we, my experience uh, with a lot of this data is in North Carolina. I have a background working in public health practice at the local level. And <clears throat> the NC EDS, North Carolina Electronic Disease Surveillance System, is North Carolina's way for chronic, or sorry, communicable disease cases that are required for reporting to be reported. So, you know, pre-pandemic, they got fax, faxes with confirmed cases. Um, you can, I'm just going to share a side note, you know, the number one thing that public health departments purchased technology-wise in the pandemic is a is a fax machine. They, they were purchasing fax machines because they were getting so many COVID results and it wasn't automated. It, I'm happy to report that it is now automated. <laughs> um, but anyways, that data set, you know, could we look at it and see what that, is there anything there with the report, the required reportable communicable diseases? We talked about NC Detect, which is North Carolina's emergency room and EMS data, which Maggie has a lot of experience with, um, you know, could we take some of the data that Jamie and Rodrigo have access to, could we find power outage events and then map them with emergency room data and show some change over time? Um, and then finally, we talked about outlining the actual cost of health and using different codes that healthcare systems use in order for reimbursement and um, potentially looking at the number of years lost to life is a common indicator in 
public health. There's a, another database called um, the County Health Rankings that looks at some of that information. And I want to sum up with kind of, I think, where we're at now, which is the empowered data. This is a publicly available data set um, that is CVMS data. So that's Medicaid, Medicare, CHIP uh, recipients, and specifically whether or not they're using some sort of power assisted device to maintain their health. Um, I'm gonna pause because I could probably talk for another hour, but this is a perfect spot for Maggie to kind of show us what she's found uh, using that data set. Um, I guess you can move to the next slide, Jamie. Yeah, so um, thanks to everyone for um, bringing us together. We're very much a new team. So this is these maps that I'm going to show are very much off, 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 hot off the press. Um, my student Tyler just made them the other day. Um, but yeah, Jennifer provided a perfect lead. Um, you know, we've just started talking and we're trying to think about how we can merge all our data sets together to kind of get a better uh, understanding of Jamie and Rodrigo's question. And the first data set that really seems promising is the Empower data. So this um, provides information on Medicare recipients who uh, require electricity. And it, it's a really great tool used by um, communities to kind of get situational awareness during different events. Um, We've just taken our first cut at mapping the Empower data. Um, so this is a map. It just shows um, the number of power dependent devices at the zip code level. It should be adjusted by the underlying population to get a rate. It's not, again, hot off the press, um, you know, uh, made maybe like an hour or two ago. Um, um, but one way to make it better is to really get at the rate. Um, so, but you can see here, just looking at the total numbers, um, that there are some interesting discrepancies. It does look like rural areas, looks like Western North Carolina. It does have a, a higher share of um, the population or Medicare uh, recipients that require um, power. And, you know, some of these storage devices, um, that were described earlier potentially could be a solution for these um, locations. Um, yeah, so this is showing power dependent devices. Uh, it's not adjusted for underlying population, but typically when you map diseases, you would just see the urban areas. Um, so seeing the rural areas here, I'm sure if you adjust for underlying population, it would, the rural areas would be even more um, higher, more maximized. So it definitely looks like you know, it's these rural communities that are most at risk uh, for power outages and uh, individuals with these devices require them. Um, next slide. Um, and so this is not a very well projected map. Again, I apologize, uh, not very much preliminary still, but this is the same data at the national level. So you can kind of see on what's going on nationally, as well as we just saw prior, what was going on at a more local level. Um, but again, there's some interesting hot spots. Um, you know, it definitely looks like our area is a location um, that has a lot of individuals who, who require power for medical devices. So I think, you know, Jamie, when he brought us all together, was onto something there, and we're just starting to prove it with our data. Um, and again, this empower data, it's cross sectional, um, so it's only at the yearly level. Um, and we've talked a couple ways on how to analyze it, how to, how to integrate all these different uh, data streams. Um, it's hard because the power outage, the electricity data is, is not at a great spatial resolution. It's also really hard to capture um, it at, at, a, um, at a national level. Um, I know a lot of that's tied up um, in the private industry. And so, we were kind of brainstorming this week before this presentation, so some different ways we could take this methodologically. And I thought I'd wrap up with that um, to kind of gear where we're headed. And that's the next slide or where I think we're headed. You guys can tell me if we're not headed that way. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think methodologically, there's two ways we could take this. Um, the first is kind of to do a case study approach, which was kind of hinted at. Um, so taking, you know, some power outage event that was pretty widespread, maybe in our area, 
and seeing it, how that affected health outcomes. And I, I'm showing an article here because it's kind of a similar method and also using a data set uh, that Jennifer talked about, NC Detect. Um, NC Detect's a great resource in North Carolina. It provides um, you know, complete spatial temporal resolution of emergency department visits across the state. Um, and it's free. It's free if you're a North Carolina resident. It's hard to get access to, um, but if you're kind of a squeaky wheel and email them a lot, they'll eventually um, give it to you. Um, you have to go through a pretty rigorous data use agreement. Um, but we do have access. Um, I do, and a couple of my students do. And this data set's really cool because you, you have your ICD-9 and 10 codes, and these are your diagnostic codes uh, for why people go to the emergency room. And you can kind of code for certain health outcomes. And that's what we did in this, um, this study. We did it um, in, in regards to Hurricane Florence. Um, so not a power outage event, but an extreme event that did likely cause power outages. And we coded for mental health outcomes. So we coded for suicide ideation, self-harm. And we used a, a technique, quasi-experimental research design. So kind of a pre-post analysis to find a causal association um, between, for this paper, mental health outcomes um, and increase after the hurricane. Um, so I believe if we could get, you know, that severe um, power outage event, zero on a location that was really impacted, we could do a similar type analysis with health data, looking at the pre-post and, and really getting at the causal association between the two. So that's one methodological location or avenue we, we might take. And the second one is on the next slide. Um, and this is just an example from a prior study um, that we published, but um, another way to look at it is to identify populations that are vulnerable or who would benefit um, from these types of energy storage um, devices. Um, and that would be doing some of this mapping. So looking, um, mapping cross-sectional data um, and multiple types of cross-sectional data and then using some sort of GIS technique, which we call multi-criteria evaluation to kind of, this is probably not the right word, but like summarize all of it. Um, there's a lot of different types of techniques to do that. Um, for this particular paper, we used analytical hierarchical processing, but basically we're, we could take the empower data, we could take the frequency of uh, power outages, and then maybe the frequency of severe weather, so severe storms, um, you know, hurricanes, high wind, uh, ice events, and we could integrate those all three together using a GIS platform to really identify, you know, those areas that would benefit um, from these types of energy alternatives. Um, so that's another methodological avenue we could take, um, particularly with the Empower data, which doesn't really have great temporal resolution, but does give us a lot of a spatial variability. Um, and so those are the directions we're thinking of taking from my perspective from our past meeting. But um, next slide. Oh, yeah. And then a cool thing about this is you can, um, this type of analysis is you can integrate multiple data sources together to try to get understanding of vulnerability and resilience. Um, so this is an example from um, a work we did looking at vulnerability of nursing home residents, but this particular map just looks at uh, uh, the frequency of extreme weather events. And we're integrating a couple different um, uh, events, so storm surge, hurricanes, and inland flooding, um, wildfires, tornadoes. And we're using that, we're doing a, a, a factor analysis to kind of map that vulnerability. And so you can see locations, this is just for extreme weather, it doesn't have anything to do with power or health. You can see how often those types of events occur, occur, you know, predominantly on the coast, but we could really zero in, zoom in on um, the Appalachian Mountains and see the frequency across uh, different locations. But that, so that's kind of what we're thinking when we talk about doing this GIS multi-criteria evaluation is integrating all these data sources together um, to kind of spatially identify um, locations uh, that are vulnerable or resilient. Next slide, please. Yeah, so that's kind of the direction we're headed. Um, this, this is a new area for all of us. Um, and we would welcome any you know, questions or ideas or discussion.
So please let us know what we can do. Well, thanks everybody for that uh, fast overview. Um, so we we kept in our time limit. So we have about we have a little bit more than thirty minutes for discussion questions. You know, as everybody stated, we're you know this is an early early stage journey for us. Uh, so we welcome any ideas for to make the research better, other data sets, uh, and or collaboration. So uh, I'll I'll be quiet and let people ask questions. Um, I think there's a few things came through in the chat. From that first image, yeah. Um, any questions? Yeah, first, this is incredible. And I think um, I'm with Clean Energy Group. And while we're based in Vermont, I'm actually in the upstate of South Carolina and I'm a North Carolina native. Know ASU very well. Um, have niece and nephew there right now. And also lived up there for a while. So go app. Um, and right now I'm, I'm also working to try to figure out how to get uh, solar and storage for a resilient system on 29 habitat homes in Greenville, South Carolina. So well, we have a, a technical assistance program that kind of does that. But we're also very working on um, quantifying, trying to figure out how to, pro how to better, our, our focus is on um, resilience for uh, vulnerable populations. And so this, this is, Perfect, um, and I'm I'm a non-energy benefits nerd. Um, I like I love trying to put values on these uh, exactly what you're trying to do. Is there beyond identifying um, the where the vulnerable populations are and where the ER you know where the ER hits are and that kind of thing. Is there a way then to, are you going to take it a step further and look at who's, who's paying the bill? Um, therefore, who should be adding, you know, who, who should be subsidizing the, the, the cost of these systems among the vulnerable populations where they're most needed? Are you going to try to get at that? That's a great question. Yeah, when we, when we first began, um, we were, you know, we were thinking automatically of the, lo the local hospital systems and the county and the EMS services. Um, and we, and now we're at the stage of like working with the data to try and figure out what those costs are. But yeah, definitely wrapping that back to, to see, uh, you know, who, who's benefiting if you reduce that and, and would they be willing to, to help uh, defray the cost? Because putting the systems on, you know, looking at even even as prices come down, we're still probably looking at a thirty thousand dollar thirty thousand dollars for a reasonable size system for a household. So that's 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 and that's well beyond the reach of most uh, most LMI households for sure. But so we uh, any from your from your work, Shelley, any any um, do you have any experience with that? I know I know um, you you guys uh, especially with Green Mountain Power in Vermont have done a lot of work. Um, with utilities trying to trying to say okay look if you need if you need power you can pull from these batteries do you, do you have any suggestions on that i have um i'm on uh, duke energy's energy efficiency collaborative and um, have been part of their der collaborative in the past and so i have a really strong relationship with duke energy but it's you know here the difference is in the northeast they're in an iso um, and they have a you know transmission organization, and they have much more transparent transparent markets um, that value of what the batteries provide to the grid. Um, they can they can be compensated for that uh, much more easily because of the way their their grid is operated here. This is something I'm struggling with here. You know, trying to bring what we've learned in the Northeast to my home state and South and to South Carolina. We've got that problem, and then we also have the problem that, quite frankly, rates are kind of cheap. So we're that even when there are time of use rates, it's it's really hard to pull that value um, and compensate the system owner for it. Um, th that that's a struggle. Um, I can say that Duke is. Uh, expressing more interest in this. They've got a pilot in Florida um, for behind the meter batteries and what those can, services those can provide to the grid that they just announced that in Florida. 
um, but they're going to move at glacial speed. So that I think they're going to have to be told by regulators to do this. And that is where these numbers are so valuable. We also have the two public service commissions. North Carolina is doing a much better job than South Carolina. Um, the North Carolina Public Service Commission, I think, told uh, Duke that they need to put in a low income program. They're looking at tariffed on bill financing, which can help pay for this. It's not in place yet, but they're doing a pilot. They're, they're designing a pilot. Um, they're going to have to be told, basically. Um, oh, go ahead. Sorry, I was just going to go back to uh, your original question, Shelley, on, on who is uh, covering these costs. And um, Jen uh, might correct me <laughs> on this uh, right now, but if I remember correctly, the, the databases that we were considering on using, um, there were reports for people that use uh, Medicaid and Medicare. Is that correct? So, so there are people that have insurance through uh, federally funded programs. So I guess ultimately, um, yeah, may, uh, if they're federally funded, yeah, maybe the federal government would be would, would be of an it would be of value to them if it decreases uh, uh, the expenses that they have to put into these programs. Listening to you think through your response, Shelley. Hi, nice to meet you. <laughs> Um, made me think of FEMA's programming around floodplain housing. So they basically bought people's homes so that they would get out of these floodplains because the same kind of information was available about how much it's costing them to rebuild the same house over and over and over and over again. I wonder, that's, a, that's a, an idea for us to look into what they did, what, what techniques they used to prove the cost of that program. And um, it, it was, it was a lot of money that FEMA put into these outreaches. So just a thought. That's a really good one. Yeah, and, and um, yeah, that reminds me that I, maybe I didn't um, point, I, I didn't um, make a strong enough point that I guess if possible, we would like to yeah, see data that had granularity maybe also on uh, rural. Uh, rural versus urban uh, settings, because uh, yeah, I mean, we would suspect that the duration and frequency of power outages in um, in rural settings is going to be different than uh, than ur urban. I think Christine, you had your hand up a second ago. I didn't see it until we were already we were already moving. Oh, um, no problem. In fact, uh, Rodrigo sort of addressed. Um, the heart of my original question was, which was whether, you know, the medical um, subsidizers would be who you're talking about as far as, far as who should step up and defray costs. Um, but I have a different question now, <laughs> which uh, as the conversation moved, which is, um, is there some sort of metric established, or maybe this is part of what you're working on that as you make these maps, is there some sort of, um, quantifiable factor that determines inaccessibility, like, you know, topography mixed with distance from a, a hospital or like some, I'm sure there are a bunch of different factors to uh, rate the vulnerability of somebody's ability to get to medical care. And I was just curious if developing some of those metrics might be part of your um, path. I mean, that's a great point, Christine. Yeah, those those kind of exist somewhat. It can be, sometimes it can be very contentious what you define as far or near um, when you get into the heart of geography. <laughs> um, but yeah, sometimes some of those, like, you know, there's the government comes up with metrics of like medically underserved. So locations with a lot fewer resources, those are well-established. But yeah, you could easily um, integrate. The great thing about GIS is you can throw lots of data in there. You could easily calculate, you know, time 
to travel to a hospital, um, you could take that to, into account. Um, but the hardest part for me is it is you kind of have to be subjective in your definition of what's vulnerable or what's not. Um, and that can be really hard um, to make, to take that data and try to make, you know, come up with um, categories for those different distinctions. Um, but the government has a few that you can rely on. Um, one of them that comes to mind is um, the HIPSA um, codes, which Jennifer might, might know more about. But those would be great things to integrate too, um, because you know a lot like with NC Detect data, that's emergency department data, and those and there's 130 EDs, but they're not they're predominantly located in urban areas as well. Um, so there's definitely a rural urban bias in that data. Are you definitely going to be, are you going to be looking at the Carolinas or the Southeast or? For the study, or you know, might you look at Texas, for example, in last year's event? You, you, you could see only... Texas on that one graph Rodrigo showed, right? It was like way upper, upper. Uh, that's a great question, Maggie. Go, Maggie, go ahead. Um, I think we talked about doing like the mapping stuff nationally because we have the data. But if we wanted to do like a case study where we show like this event caused you know, 1,000 extra ED visits. We would have to do that in North Carolina because that's where our data is. But Jamie might have a better, he's our like vision. He's keeping our vision. <laughs> he might have a better idea. No, I think that's, I think that's dead on your, um, you know, I think this, this annual data, the, the annual data will look and just see um, what we see across and see if there's any correlation between between an increase in duration or frequencies with medical with medical costs but then the the specific the specific events i think we'll have to stick to north carolina just based on our data shelly one other one other quick point uh while, while i'm while i'm still rolling um something that came to mind as you were speaking a little while ago talking about different programs just something to think about uh, is i wonder uh, with the uptake of electric vehicles, if local utilities will begin to value storage, which seems ironic because you have, you know, this big battery back in the car, but having storage on site that's integrated with the charging so you can kind of delay delay the big inrush of power when you're charging vehicles. I, I wonder if that could have an impact on the value of storage for ut utilities valuing them for households. Totally. Um, what we're going to be seeing is a vehicle to grid. Um, vehicle to house and vehicle to grid, and we're also we're already seeing, uh, for example, there's a resilient there's a church that we funded a um, technical assistance on in uh, California that is using a fleet of Nissan Leafs as their backup power uh, when to to create a resilience hub at the church. So you know they'll have solar charging the you know charging the 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 vehicles and then the vehicles will fleet will serve as backup power in the event of of a loss we're going to that's where everything's going um and also quite frankly a vehicle battery uh, per kilowatt hour is much cheaper than a tesla power wall for example and you can drive it and with the ford lightning you can haul stuff so that is definitely where things are heading um, and actually, I was talking about that with the Habitat um, the folks in Greenville about, OK, if we can't afford to put storage on these houses, can we at least wire them up for a future EV? Um, and then when that EV is available to serve as the backup power for that house. Um, then there's also a lot of uh, a lot of companies and the utilities are very interested in, of course, managing the charging rates so that, you know, things don't you know, five o'clock, everybody comes home, everybody plugs in, that doesn't happen. Um, Duke, I believe is gonna have a pilot in North Carolina to study that. Um, so that's gonna be a big thing too. It's, you know, I think in the end, it's, that surge is not hitting the grid, it's not gonna be as big a problem as people think because the technology to manage the time of charging is gonna be there. And then those vehicles could also become grid assets as well. So that's exactly where we're heading. I was actually I was actually being a little bit less progressive. Um, I was thinking of the glacial speed of some of our some of our utilities and how how quickly they adopt things, and thinking that 
maybe have before we before we even link a vehicle to the to the grid if they would see a value in having fixed storage uh, at the site to sort of to be able, they could control because it's hooked up to the meter when they can't necessarily control the cars right away uh, to sort of like to sort of dampen the the inrush charging of vehicles but um, I, I like your vision I like your your more progressive vision better they will Duke will be st studying um, in their EV pilot in North Carolina studying when you know when people hook up that to be a, to be eligible you'll, you'll people will get a rebate, I think, for the charging infrastructure in exchange for providing their data. And then Duke will study that because they study everything to death. And then they'll come up with a way to manage EV charging so that it doesn't do that. But yeah, then, but then the EV itself being an asset, whole new thing. And that's where we're going. I'm curious if some other ways, some other indicators of or, or um, forms of vulnerability related to like communications and telehealth, the prevalence of telehealth or things that might be, I love that the Empower data has that energy dependent, um, medically vulnerable sort of indication. But then are there some other things that if the power goes out for someone who um, is getting most of their primary care via telehealth or something like that, you know, how, how far that could go, I guess, in this inquiry or contribute. I mean, that'd be telehealth. great. Telehealth. Yeah, go ahead. I was just going to, I'll give it to you. I don't know of any data sources. That'd be awesome though. <laughs> yeah. You take it, Jennifer. Um, I also don't, if I think telehealth and how we would get that kind of data, then we'd be going back to what Jamie and Rodrigo's original problem was, which is that there is no master data set. It's all individual hospitals, clinics, you know, they all have their own EMR medical record tracking all of that. Um, that, that might be a good idea though, for a case study, if we were able to I think it would take a, a shnikey ton of work, right, Maggie, to try and get EMR data from hospital systems, um, but doable. And um, while I have the role to quote Jamie, um, we were talking about FEMA and just to explain like, so you have the federal government and, and you have FEMA and then FEMA funds different emergency management uh, streams. And one of them is uh, state and then region and then county. So the state gets funding and then they have these dippers, disaster preparedness regions. So we're in uh, Wat Watauga County is in dipper eight, for example. And then each county has an emergency manager and they have these regional meetings where they come together and, you know, they, they're really co collective. They're um, probably one of the most collective impact things happening in preparedness and emergency management. So they all come together on, on a quarterly basis and or via Zoom now that, you know, we, we do that more. <laughs> and they elect each other as chairs. There's a public health branch, there's a fire branch, there's a law enforcement branch, all these different branches. And then they vote on what their region needs resource wise to become more resilient based on an emergency. So for example, um, during the pandemic, something that was really needed for local public health were vaccine storage containers that were not powered. You know, the, there are these excellent cubes that you can put in and then you can drive vaccine, specifically COVID-19 vaccine from one area to another because of the way it was distributed from the federal government. So I guess I'm saying that out loud because maybe there's like two policy approaches here, right? One could be at the local level where they're actually asking for these kinds of things to be provided to their communities. And then also, you know, that, that big data impact. Um, anyways, I'll stop talking. <laughs> Do you all know Jennifer? if there's a state that, oh, <laughs> is there a state perhaps more progressive in what kinds of medically vulnerable 
indicators, like data that they collect? Like does Texas do a better job than North Carolina or is this just a federal requirement and it's flat across all the states? There's, okay, hmm. that's unfortunate. So Maggie, would the Empire data uh, allow you to distinguish not just rural from urban and that sort of thing, but the exact locations? It seems to me when, it, when that category of rural can be broken down into very rural, uh, like as in exurban development and things like that, where you would truly have an issue of access or assistance rather than uh, just kind of rural where it, an emergency vehicle getting there or something like that would be actually a lot less problematic than in, than, than in many areas, especially if you're talking about a weather event that makes travel difficult and yeah. takes out power. That's a great point. I kind of hints at Christine's question too. I don't think the empower data gets at that, um, but you know, the definition of rural and rurality, my favorite data source is RUCA codes. And these are codes, um, I think they're originally created by the USDA, um, but they um, they assign census tracts or zip codes, 10 codes, and they can be like, and then within those codes, they have decimals, so you can get really fine grained, but it takes into account not only like a location, but also how many of those people commute. So do 20% of the people commute to a an urban area or a semi-urban area or a small town. Um, and like at the very end, like 10, which is the most rural, you get like these really rural and isolated communities. So like when you map it for North Carolina, it's like Swain County, you know, <laughs> like not much around it. So whereas like Watauga County is like a, a town or a small city. Um, so yeah, you can overlay these RUCA codes or look at the empower data by different des designations to kind of get at some of those. That's my favorite data source. I use it all the time to kind of get it rural and urban and you can really break up your categories based off your interests and how you want to define rural and urban which can get complex fast. Yeah. It just seems to me you could parse this out in, in lots of different ways. I mean, I don't know whether you know, you could do this by income, by race, or, you know, to look at all sorts of inequities in, in uh, these social systems and thus the potential for these types of devices to be more valuable, so to speak, in some homes than in others and so on and so forth. So. Yeah, that'd be great. Unfortunately, our data is aggregate, but I was reading online, you can get individual level data with like race, hopefully. I don't know how you do that. I imagine it's a, lar a long, arduous process, but um, it, that would be really interesting to look at disparities. Do you mean heard, through the RUCA data or just? For the Empower it? data, I apologize. Oh, Empower, okay. Yeah. Um, yesterday, uh, I got to attend a talk by, um, a cultural anthropologist named Amber Wutich, and she's the director, I don't know if you all know her, um, of maybe a Center for Global Health, some name like that at Arizona State University. And she does, um, uh, she was talking about participatory research methods um, and kind of doing anthropological uh, complementary research to some technological adoption work in the water area. And I wonder, uh, we have some cultural anthropologists here. I wonder if, uh, if you all thought of partnering with somebody to have either an ethnography or a participatory research citizen science methods of getting a human angle flavor. Cause like, I know sometimes you could get all the numbers from an area and you would miss like, what's the power structure there. They're not going to the hospital because there is some other pull that you would only know culturally from the inside of that group. Um, have you thought of partnering or would that ever be of interest?
I would say I would say yes. Um, we I, I don't know that um, I've had the brain space to think of that directly, but um, I'll, what what does everybody else say? That's a Absolutely. really crucial point. Is you know, with everything we do, we're always working with frontline communities and on the ground, and you learn a ton um, that can really change the direction of you know something you thought might be a solution isn't going to work. Um, or and whereas other ideas bubble up that you never would have thought of. So I think in, incorporating ground truthing essentially is um, a great idea. Agreed. She gave one funny example. I'll share super fast of um, in her field. There, there is a famous example of um, some people coming and bringing toilets to because they were trying to, you know, get sewage out of the streets of this town. Then they came back to visit three years later, and everyone was using their toilet to plant flowers. So there's just like plants growing out of them. And so they have this little toilet with plants growing out of them as like their mark of failure. Like you didn't, you didn't learn what the people need for adoption. Um, so don't let your toilet become a planter is their like little motto now of as far as get buy in up front with designing. That's great. Well, I see we're, um, we're, we still have a few minutes, but we're approaching the top of the hour. Any other, any other comments or questions or thoughts? What's your timeline? That's a really good question. Um, we're, this is, um, this is, uh, sort of a, it was a, a great collaboration that happened organically and, um, we're fitting it in. Um, we do, we are planning a presentation with some, like, with some actual numbers crunched at the State Energy Conference, um, which is, which is not very far away. I think it's, um, I think it's the end of April, if I'm not mistaken. So we'll have to have something together by then. And then we hope to have a paper put together um, for the end of the summer. So that's, that's where we're headed now. But um, we, unfortunately, um, we are not moving as quickly as as uh, as I think all of us would like, but just based on our time, you know, the the free time to actually work on it. Um, lo love to hear uh, more from you, Shelley, as as we go forward. Though, are you also talk? Are you talking to other entities, kind of working in what I call non energy benefits in that space? Um, one in particular is Lisa Skumatz. She's, I think she's in Vermont, actually. Um, but like for additional insight into how, how to value, you know, how to get at the value. I'd love to, I'd love to have a chat with Lisa. I'm not, I don't know her. Um, we will be, um, we will be meeting with um, Elizabeth Wilson from Dartmouth uh, in a week uh, and her group, they have a, they're, they're I, from, from the information I have, they're working in a similar direction. Um, I don't know Elizabeth well, but we've been to a couple of conferences together. So um, when I saw one of their, they had a call out for a researcher they're trying to hire. So I, I reached out and we're going to have a meeting just to see what they're doing. So we don't really have a good uh, network built around this. This is sort of a new area for all of us. So any, um, yeah, if you if you uh, had some contacts and you wanted to jump in to a call sometime with us, that would be great. I don't know Lisa personally, but I know of her work um, and I can give you her information. Okay, um, that'd be great. Yeah, you're, this, is, this is so valuable. I mean, so valuable. Everybody keeps talking about the value of resilience and so far nobody is able to put numbers on it. And if we're going to change policy, we've got to put numbers on it. I agree, yeah, I think, you know, Businesses and industries have an easy time valuing their resilience, but this this space has not really been explored. So, um, yeah, thanks thanks so much for the comments and the in the great in the great input. Any any other uh, questions or comments? I can jump in on the back end as always, Jamie. I, I don't know. Is is a you know thinking about the whole valuation stuff is the the benefit cost kind of framework any use bit like you know i'm thinking a bit like the maison reciprocity stuff we did a while back the upfront cost and then the um 
you know, defining the, the suite of benefits over time. And that might be, Defin that might definitely. Be I had, I had not thought of, I had not thought about the time, you know, sort of the time weighted aspect um, for the cost benefit analysis, but that would be great. Yeah. We'll, um, when we have, when we get some first numbers together, um, maybe we can, maybe we can chat and see, um, see what you think. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I was going to ask, uh, so Maggie, you said earlier about, you know, when the people um, go to hospital, you know, why, why they've gone to hospital. Is that right? Yeah, I, I have their, um, so when they go to the hospital, we have their diagnostic codes. There are 11, co there's up to 11 codes. Okay, but um, you, do you know anything else about them? Do you know yes. What, you do oh, see okay. individual level data on those people? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have, um, like um, 13 million ED visits. I have a very bad computer for it. I can barely process it. <laughs> Just why RA Triple E's here. Um, um, <laughs> Resource needs. Yeah, yeah. Um, but um, yeah, I have, uh, you know, who paid for it? Was it Medicare or Medicaid? Was it self pay? Um, was it an employer? Um, the 11 codes, you can get all sorts of codes. It's really cool now. They aren't using them much. And Jennifer probably knows more about this. They have Z codes now, which are social determinants of health codes. Um, so they get at some of the um, social, the built environment. Um, and so you can pair those with like heart attack or respiratory, anything you can think of, you can code for it. Um, and race, ethnicity, race and gender. So all that's available. Um, that's pretty interesting then. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll take that opportunity to close. I think uh, several, several folks have uh, meetings to go to right at two in our Zoom world, so we'll, we'll, uh, we'll wrap up. But Christine, thanks so much for, uh, for hosting the event, and Grace, thanks for organizing and getting us all here, and thanks everybody for coming and listening, and uh, look forward, to, uh, look forward to, uh, to more collaborations. So, uh, and Shelly, thanks for joining from uh, outside the university. It's great to have a, it's great to have a, a view from outside the university. Um, so thank you and, and nice to meet you. So glad with what you're doing up there. It's fantastic. Thank you. We'll keep